Parts Express, the number one source for audio, video, and speaker building components. Hi, I'm Mike from Parts Express. Today we're looking at the BR1 two-way monitor system. A lot of customers come to us for speakers, and this is the best way to get your feet wet in building your own speaker. You'll save hundreds of dollars over the retail equivalent by building yourself, and along the way you'll learn a lot of valuable speaker building tips. The system includes two ported cabinets with grills. Additionally, you're going to get a pair of Dayton Silk Dome DC28F-8 tweeters and two of the Dayton Classic 6.5 inch woofers. Additionally, what's included is going to be your crossover circuit board, and there's two of those included, a section of wire, speaker ceiling cock, and the various crossover components that you need in order to build this speaker and get it set up right the first time, as well as getting it to sound good. The BR1 kit also comes with a construction workbook that'll take you from start to finish, step by step, and finally some damping foam to put on inside of your speaker. The next step after ensuring that you've received all of the products that come with the BR1 kit, which you would do with the parts inventory list, you will want to separate the crossover components from the rest of the items, as well as the crossover circuit board. On the parts list, next to the description of each part is the actual component name in regards to the actual circuit board. This 6.2 microfarad capacitor is going to be C1. So what you would do is basically line this up with C1, get an idea of where the leads are going to go, bend the leads, and fit them through the pre-drilled holes. Flip the crossover over, pull the leads back a little bit, and solder them in place. After the solder cools to the touch, what you would want to do is take a set of diagonal cutters and remove the excess lead. Personally, I recommend starting with the smaller components, working your way to the larger components, because those can get quite heavy and make it a little bit more difficult to complete the entire crossover. So set those aside, save those for last, biggest goes last. Now we're ready to solder. <clears throat> I recommend using the Stahl Tools Very Temperature Soldering Iron as it compares to soldering irons that could be up to 10 times its actual price. Uh, we have replacement tips and it comes pre tin so you're ready to go right out of the box. Before soldering, always make sure you have a sponge that's wet. What this is going to do is keep your tip clean, nice and shiny for a good soldering connection. Many customers call into our tech department to ask about soldering. A lot of people have started out with a very low cost soldering iron that doesn't get nearly hot enough in order to make a good solder joint. That's why I recommend the Stahl Tools Variable Temperature Soldering Iron. You know out of the box you have a pre tin tip, you're ready to go, you can set this thing on max, be ready in a matter of minutes. In order to solder, what you do is wait for this to get hot. And in order to know that, what you do is you get your sponge wet, put your iron on there. If it's making a hissing sound, it's hot enough, you're ready to go take the solder in one hand. I recommend the thinnest solder that you can find. 20 thousandths or 30 thousandths will work just fine for this application. You basically have a metal to metal junction right here and what you're doing is miniature welding. So basically what you do is you take your solder and your iron, put the iron across the two pieces, heat them up, feed the solder into that junction and once it looks like it's populating both spaces, pull off. What you're looking for is a nice shiny mound of solder that leads from the point to which you solder to, and in this case the copper board, to the actual component's lead. In order to make sure you have a good solder joint, what you would want to do is come back around, pull on the lead, make sure it has no give whatsoever, take the lead and fold it back. If the lead folds back such as this, that's a good solder joint. I recommend soldering one component at a time because that will minimize confusion and clutter. Not only that, it makes this a lot easier to deal with in terms of flipping it back and forth. Once you have your solder joint complete, get a set of diagonal cutters and cut the excess lead. I recommend the Exolite small diagonal cutters that we sell here at Parts Express. They work very well for this application. What you want to do is go all the way to the base of where the lead comes out and just simply cut and remove. Stand this back up. Get as close as you can, cut and remove. What you're looking to avoid is any type of short between one junction and where another one might occur. That's another reason I recommend just doing one component at a time. 
This particular capacitor that we're working with here is the 0.1 microfarad Dayton Audio Film and Foil capacitor. We are putting it in parallel with the electrolytic capacitor because the electrolytic capacitors are low expensive and by wiring this in parallel you're increasing the value by 0.1 microfarads. However, you're also increasing the actual audio value of the capacitor because this is going to lead to a better hysteresis than this would have by itself. So by putting these together, what you're doing is you're creating a capacitor that is going to hold closer to its rated value of 47 microfarads. You're adding a 0.1, so you're going to end up with a 47.1 microfarad capacitor. And when you get around where that capacitor actually starts to work in the circuit, it's going to hold closer to that value because of this bypass capacitor. What you have to do to install it is run the leads in parallel. So that means you want to stack these long side by long side and then just run the leads down here together. Pull the leads back kind of tight. Solder this point right here and then remove the excess. It gets kind of tight so it's really good to have a pencil thin soldering iron tip. Again, this is where doing one component at a time really, really helps. Because as you can see, the inductors aren't in the way to prohibit the access to solder this point together. Put the soldering iron back, take your tweezers or if you have something else and just you're looking to make sure that junction took hold really, really well. You're looking for a nice shiny junction or mound of solder. And you're looking to make sure that this has very little to no give. So take those leads, pull them out of the way, and remove the excess while making sure that you're not cutting the lead of the original 47 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. And that's what it'll look like when that part's finished. So now that you've got your crossover assembled, what you're gonna notice is that there's nothing holding these in place except for the soldering connections on the back. What you want to do to ensure that these are not moving around inside of the speaker is to use some hot glue just to secure them to the board. The most important part is going to be this large inductor. It's going to want to move around as much as possible. So what you got to do is just come up and give it a nice solid bead in between the bottom of the inductor and the actual printed circuit board. Even if it looks ugly, you can always come back and scrape it off after it's dried. Make sure not to get it on your fingers because this is hot and it will burn. After the inductor, what you're going to want to do is hot glue the capacitors. There's not much surface area, so what you want to do is make sure you get the glue gun all the way down in there. Make sure that the bead that you're laying touches both the capacitor and the printed circuit board. The resistors are pretty much held in place due to their size or their shape and how tight you're actually able to get in there with the leads to solder them to the board. So it's not necessarily needed, however, you might as well while you have the hot glue gun going. Lastly, you're going to want to hit this inductor. You don't need nearly as much because of the, um, the exposed edge. And then once it's dried, if you want to clean it up, of course, go at it with a razor blade just to take off any of the excess that might have overlapped the board, such as right here. And take off all the strings created by the hot glue. Of course, this is not necessary. This is just basically for looks and aesthetics. What you want to do is a little test just to make sure everything is nice and solid on the board because while the glue is hot, you can always go back and touch it up as needed. So now that we have the crossover squared away, the next step is to take the included wire and cut six 12 inch sections. I got my handy dandy cutter strip, stripping tool and I'm going to set the actual stripping depth 
to about 3 eighths of an inch as instructed by the manual. So I've already pre-measured and marked the actual wire. I'm just going to cut right where I marked. And again, I do recommend these handy dandy wire cutter stripping tools as they are well worth their weight in gold. So, I've got six. I have a little bit extra left on one. We can use that just in case we have a hard time reaching the board from one of the drivers or have a hard time going from the crossover into the cabinet. So next what I'm going to do is separate the conductors and strip them back each about 3 eighths of an inch. Of course, uh, one of the key components of stripping a wire is to make sure that none of the conductors are left behind in the insulation. I don't consider it a big deal, however, I was always taught in my electricity classes that you want to leave as much wire on the actual conductor as possible. Some people might ask why I chose to go with 3 8 of an inch rather than a half inch as was stated in the manual is that I don't want any exposed wire after I attach the solderless connectors to the cable itself. Any exposed wire can obviously create a potential short. So now that you have your individual cable stripped, what you want to do is grab your favorite cable. Now what we're working with is a 16 to 14 gauge solderless connector. What you want to do is install the connectors so that this bulk part or this larger diameter part is left on the outside of the tool such as that. Some people go up just a hair higher. Firstly, either way will work. So once you have the connector in place, take your wire, twist it so that it's nice and uniform. Maybe split them out just a little bit more. Feed them in. And what you're looking for is the actual wire to pop through the connector. What you're going to want to do is make sure that the conductor is actually exposed a little bit on the wire. This is going to ensure a good crimp. Squeeze and pull. If it doesn't come off, that connection is good to go. So simply move on. You have about 24 terminals or solderless connectors to install. So now that you have all of your cables made up, what you're going to want to do is install them to the actual crossover board. The crossover board is clearly marked for the input, woofer, and tweeter terminals, as well as the phase or proper polarity for how the cable connects to the speaker. Make sure you observe the proper polarity, otherwise your speaker will not sound correct. Uh, you might notice a loss of bass or the tweeters might image to the left or to the right, depending on the actual input signal. That's what it looks like with all of the cables connected. Go to part two for the rest of the BR1 assembly.